everybody, and welcome back to the workshop. In today's episode, we're going to do this. This is not this. That's something else entirely. What this is, well, right now it's just some graphite scratched on a little paper, but what it represents is the idea, the concept for the world's nicest marshmallow roasting fork. It will be integral, twisted W's Damascus, with maybe the most perfect handle material pairing of all time. I don't say that lightly. Allow me to show you what I mean. Really quick, I uh, just wanna show you guys, this is one of the jaw covers that I made for my Reed 108 bench vise. This thing is awesome. I love covering the jaws of my bench vise with steel, but I love even more covering my jaws with Factor. <laughs> Factor is a meal subscription service that sends you fresh, chef-prepared, never-frozen meals straight to your door. They just show up in a box and they're delicious. They're an excellent way to get good, wholesome food without having the hassle of going to the grocery store, messing up your kitchen, going and getting takeout, going and getting fast food, which is even worse. They're good for you. They cater to what your dietary restrictions are, whether that's keto, calorie smart, vegetarian, vegan. They have 34 plus different meals that you can choose from every week, which means you're not gonna be eating the same old thing over and over again. You keep things interesting but you can also go back to the things that you enjoy. So I highly recommend it if you live a busy lifestyle or if you are bad at cooking. Or maybe you're not bad at cooking, but you just don't have time to do it all the time. Just this morning, I went to jujitsu and then I came home and decided to make pancakes. And it took me almost an hour to make the pancakes and I lost my whole morning. So whether you're not so great at cooking or maybe you're just busy or whatever it is, if delicious, quick to eat, delivered to your door meals sounds like a good idea to you, head to factor75.com and use code willstelter 50 for 50% 50 off your first box. Thank you Factor for sponsoring today's episode. With that, let's, um, now many of you probably have seen a toasted marshmallow before. You might even have toasted one yourself, which means that you are probably familiar with this set of colors right here. This is some fossilized mammoth ivory that just so happens to be perfect toasted marshmallow colors. So the plan is to have this be our handle material. We'll be holding it together with some little Torx head screws. We're gonna have an integral guard and pommel. And so this beautiful set of ivory will sit on either side of the tang be held firmly in place by those screws. With that, let's fire up the forge. We're gonna start off with some W's Damascus. This is our bar here. Uh, it's already started as some leftover material that I had from a previous project. So right now, this bar is in the C shape. That doesn't mean that it looks like the ocean. That means that we started off with our layers stacked up like this. We then rotated the billet and those straight layers as we crushed down from the top and bottom went like that. That's how we got there. It's mostly 1080 with some 15 and 20 in there. It's lighter on the 15 and 20 than it is on the 1080, which means that it's a darker billet. I'm gonna keep it at about two inches wide because I have some other 15 and 20 that I wanna stick in between there to help lighten up the pattern overall. With a shape like that where I want everything to be integral, the pattern is gonna be a little bit of a challenge because things are gonna get so dang stretched out that something that might look good forged out into a chef's knife from this bar will look a lot different when I forge that shape pretty close. There are a few things that I can do to kind of help that pattern still look good despite the fact that we have a lot of distortion that's going to happen to it. We'll talk more about that later on. For now, let's fire up the forge and get to a whacking. The first step is to stretch out our billet of W's to get it ready to restack. This means drawing it out, thinning it down in all of the dimensions so that I have more room to get more layers to make it easier to forge. I'm gonna start off in the hammer, get it precision forged on the press, and then planish it or make the surface finish a little nicer back on the hammer. After that, we're ready for restacking seven times. There was a little bit of weird distortion where I kind of got a full W in some of the pieces. Uh, that's just from squishing out the edge and then squishing it back in. Thank you. 
24 inches. But with it welded back together, it's ready to go back in the forge to draw down once again. welded and drawn out. I cut it into five pieces to get it ready to restack. I also inserted four thick layers of 15 and 20 and that will help visually brighten up the pattern. It won't be such a dark piece when it's etched and it gives me a little bit more steel to work with. With the final forge weld set, I'm going to draw it down to be able to be twisted in my twisting machine. This is a very old way of bringing the pattern to the surface of the billet to make it a little bit more interesting to look at. Before I twist it, I had to hot cut off the handle end underneath the power hammer. That allows me to get closer to the actual billet with my twisting machine. With the billet tightly twisted up, I wanted to re-square it. I put a little bit of flux on the surface to helpfully forge weld together some of those ridges that are created during the twisting process. However, since they don't all forge weld, I needed to do a little bit of light grinding before going back and do the actual forging. Now, most of you guys probably know that the process that I'm doing right now is called forging. The reason why we call it forging is because we're, uh, it's, uh, we're using the forge. Now, the way that I'm gonna be forging this here marshmallow roaster is right now we have a nice, it's wider than that, bar of steel. It's a little bit of a funky shape because I need to have the pommel at the end I need to have a tang in the middle of it. I then need to have a great big wide guard that's a lot wider than our piece of steel, and then it needs to come back down and forge our fork. I'm not worried about forging the fork. I'm not really worried about forging the pommel because I have plenty of material there. I am worried about forging in my guard lugs. First things first is I'm going to throw it in the, in the press and cut in some shoulders where our pommel will be. I have a little handle on this end of the belt that I'll be working it from. I'm going to start by forging this down here. From there, I'm going to take a hot chisel. It's actually, the chisel itself is cold, but you use it while things are hot, which is why we call it a hot chisel. And I'm going to chisel myself in some good, deep channels. Um, and, that, and, our, and our pattern and our steel is going like that. And so when we take those channels and we open them up, we will then have something that kind of looks like that. Does that look familiar to you? It 
should because it's close to what we're trying to forge. We don't want this to be too thin because we need to have a little bit of room for our garden here, but I'm gonna leave those suckers really thick. Uh, I think this is gonna be really challenging to try and forge really, really close to shape. And so I'm gonna leave this thick enough that I can stock remove it down to being totally symmetrical and square. But after that, it's kind of easy going. I just jinxed myself. It'll be hard. Uh, all we'll have to do though is fuller in here and then draw down our blade to the, not blade, stick, the stick portion. Uh, and then forge out our nice little marshy malo fork. I've done double lug integrals before. I've forged them out and never actually finished one. Uh, but I've never done it with the hot chiseling method. Uh, I know that it is possible. Uh, so we will see how it goes. With the guard lugs, cut open with the chisel, I needed to forge them towards the tip of the fork uh, to give myself a little bit more room for the transition of going from the guard into the handle itself. Now that the handle is mostly forged, it's time to forge the fork. It's fairly straightforward, splitting it down the center with that hot chisel, and then moving on and forging out the forks themselves. I had to split them apart because there was no other way to be able to forge them down and get them forged to final shape before bending them back to straightness. So here's the deal. We are almost to the length of the drawing. Uh, we're about an inch and a half shorter than it is in the drawing. 
But I didn't really base that length on anything. I just, I think, was trying to use the whole piece of paper. Uh, and so I made it like a 15 and a half inch shaft, and it's right now at about 14 inches, I think. Actually, let me check. Yeah, probably about, about 14 and a half inches. Okay, so yeah, inch and a half shy. And right now, I haven't forged any bevels into our kind of blade, I don't really know what to call it, but the, uh, this feller. On the drawing, you'll see that that area is beveled. Part of that is because I want it to have a little bit of dimension. I want it to be strong and light, and having that much surface area is going to make it that way. But because we have a twist pattern Damascus here, the farther we grind into it, the nicer the pattern is going to look. And so the decision that I have to make is, do I want to sacrifice... I could definitely get the length out of it that I needed uh, if I were to forge it down more and forge those bevels in. Not a huge problem, not very challenging to do. But it'll mean that the pattern on the piece itself is not quite as good. Uh, and I think the way that I'm leaning right now is leaving it flat with a, with a rectangular cross section uh, so that I have more Damascus to grind into to get a better pattern in the, I'm just gonna call it the blade, in the blade. That being said, we are really close to being there. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of stretch this area out, thin it down a little bit more, very carefully with a cross beam hammer, just to give a little bit more room around here to grind into. Uh, and then it's just a little bit of straightening, getting my lugs bent, a little bit of tweaking up in here, and, and we'll be ready to start normalizing and, and preparing the grain structure for grinding and then hardening. Well, it is completely forged out, and it is, might I just say, utterly ridiculous. It's cool, but this is ridiculous. It's now time to do a couple of normalizing cycles to refine the grain structure of the old Malo roaster. After that, we'll do a DET anneal. So first three cycles, we're going to bring it up to 1,550 degrees. Bring it out, let it cool in the air, and then after that, it's gonna sit at 1380 degrees for 30 minutes, and that'll soften it and make it nice to work with. I'm not gonna do a load of grinding on it before heat treat, and the reason for that is that when I start grinding on things, it'll remove the decarb area. Uh, carbon bleeds out of the steel as you forge it, and if I grind on it too much, especially in here, I'm not really worried about the rest of it, but especially in here, uh, it'll contract at a different rate and it's really likely to warp. And so what I'm gonna do is mostly work on kind of the guard area. I want the little forks that I'm gonna do at the end of my guard lugs to be pretty close, relatively close, at least rough shaped, uh, so that I don't have to do a whole lot on the inside of them. And then I want this area up here to be rough shaped as well. Kind of the stuff that I'm gonna need to use hand files for, uh, I'm gonna try and get that done uh, before heat treat, not all the way done, but close. Now we're waiting for this feller to cool down right now, but when we do throw it back in the oven, we're gonna throw it in hot. I think I'm gonna temper it at about 700 degrees. It's about 300 degrees hotter than I temper a knife, but 700 degrees ought to get this steel down to the low 50s Rockwell, which should mean that most of my files will begrudgingly cut it, which means that cutting all my facets in the fork here and then tuning up everything in the guard area, especially those little forks that I want to have on the end of my lugs, uh, will be a lot more possible. 
Uh, and the reason why we harden it at all is because for one thing, I don't want it to be fully soft. That would be a bad thing for this. Uh, it would bend easily. And I'm gonna have this be a, a pretty slender blade. I think we decided to call it the blade. Uh, and so I needed to have a little bit of hardness to it. The hardness also helps the etching process. If it's unhardened, it's really hard to get a good etch on a piece like this. Well, it is a bit of a weird feeling after such a long time of conceptualizing and daydreaming about having the opportunity to build the world's nicest marshmallow roasting fork to finally be holding the foundational beginnings of it. Uh, this was a ton of fun to forge, a huge challenge. This is one of the most complex things I've ever forged. The integral pommel, guard, long tapered shank. I still don't know what to call that part. And then the fork on the end was all not easy. Uh, it was a blast though, uh, over the last couple days of forging on this thing. Um, this is a piece that I'll be bringing with me to Blade Show 2023 in Atlanta, table 36A. Uh, if you guys are gonna be there, please swing by. Um, it will be available for sale there if I don't break it or ruin it before then. Uh, but we are gonna call it there for today's episode. I think we've gotten plenty done on here. And in the next episode, we're going to get this thing ground, handled, and finished out. I'm very much looking forward to it. Uh, so thank you guys for following along. Thank you to Factor for sponsoring today's episode. And thank you to our patrons for patronizing us. With that, I will see you guys on the next episode. Bye-bye.